recreation and transportation. Um, today, the subject of the hearing is the working session is docket number 1443 on transportation policy briefing series related to key topics and transportation policy. Uh, this matter is sponsored by Council Michelle Wu and was referred to the Committee on Parks and Recreation and Transportation on November 2nd. Um, with that, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting these. We're really excited. This is our second in a series of five, partnering with Professor Firth of Northeastern University and many of the advocacy leaders and organizations across the city. Um, so we are really excited for today's topic and for the administration, um, for all of their leadership and, and their collaboration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, for the work that you're doing with this issue of transportation in our city. Um, with that, I'm going to open up with uh, Vinny Kumpa from uh, the Transportation Department, if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, th thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'm Vinit Gupta. I'm <clears throat> the Director of Planning at the Boston Transportation Department. I'm here on behalf of uh, Chief of Street. Uh, Chris Osgood and Commissioner Gina Fiandaka of the Transportation Department. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to say a couple of things. One, we'd really like to thank uh, the, the City Council for, uh, <coughs> for hosting this uh, the series of discussions of uh, between advocates, between the Council and the administration. And the timing of these talks is particularly useful for us uh, on two fronts. One, uh, as you know, uh, the mayor launched the Vision Zero initiative with the objective of uh, eliminating fatalities and reducing injuries on our street. And we have much to learn from the discussion that will be held in these chambers on that front. Two, uh, as you know, we are uh, towards the uh, ending, the last phase, I would say, of the citywide transportation plan called Go Boston 2030. And again, uh, the conversation that we are having today, we've had the last time and we'll have in the coming months, uh, will help us think through some of the specific projects and policies that are coming out of that process. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Professor Peter Firth from Northeastern University, who's kind of uh, coming to each of these uh, talks. And we've had the great privilege of working in partnership with Peter on a number of projects, and he's coming and talking with a uh, the staff group uh, later this week. Thanks so much. Thank you. So our first panelist is Ms. Wendy Landman from Walk Boston. Welcome great. to the City Council. And you have the floor. Thank you. And um, I wanted to thank the City Council for putting this together, having us here. We're thrilled that um, active transportation and transit are such an important piece of what you're thinking about right now. Uh, we obviously think it's absolutely critical for the quality of life in Boston for all of Boston residents. Thank you for all coming, and I see many friends and allies in the audience, and we work with Vineet and the Boston Transportation Department all the time on exactly the things Vineet mentioned, uh, Vision Zero, uh, Go Boston 2030, and lots and lots of other things. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here. I hope those of you at home can follow the presentation. What I'm going to do is something that we call at Walk Boston Pedestrian Advocacy 101, or PED 101. So I'm going to talk about the basics of a walkable environment, what makes uh, a city work for people on foot. And then I'm going to talk really briefly about some of the work that uh, we're, working, we're doing with people across the city, just so people uh, who may not know how to get involved in talking about making your, your neighborhood more walker-friendly more walker and safer for um, people of all ages, how to, how to do that in the city. So. What is walkability? And, and what we think about is that it's more than just the ability to walk. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what the definition of walkability is, um, pieces of the pedestrian infrastructure, and then, like I said, some of the work that's going on in the city of Boston. So what is walkability? Well, it's a whole collection of things. Um, first of all, it's connections. And that's something that we think about a lot. Um, as a pedestrian advocacy organization, we don't spend a lot of time weighing in on zoning and the placement of different uses in the city. But that's, of course, a really important component of what makes a community walkable, having different kinds of destinations within walking distance of each other. So that's actually the second piece, is destinations. One of the things that um, we are working on across Massachusetts, and one of the things that happened 
um, over the last 75 to 100 years in the United States is we had a lot of zoning laws that suggested that different kinds of land uses, rather than being integrated in the same places and mixed up together in the community, should be segregated, that all of the housing should be in one area and commercial uses should be another and places where people work should be in another. And what we found, of course, is that that's not actually a very good way to organize communities. What it means is that people um, live at great distances from where they work, from where they go to school, from where they go shopping, and that requires people to get in a car or use transit and go a long distance. So one of the things that we think about is how to make sure that to the extent we can, we weigh in about a mix of uses and having different kinds of destinations close together. Um, another piece of the, the walking puzzle is safety. That's a big one, and I'm going to talk about some of the ways to make straight streets safer. And then finally, comfort, making sure that streets are comfortable for people, and that can mean all sorts of different things. It can mean shade in the summer. It can mean benches. It can mean access to public restrooms. Um, it can mean making sure that light signals are timed so that people at different walking speeds can get across the street. So um, one of the things that Walk Boston that we talk about is we hate being called alternative transportation because walking is actually the most basic form of transportation. It's the form of transportation that everybody engages in and that all people should be able to do in their communities. So what walking does is it allows people to get where they need to go. And everybody is a pedestrian at some point during the day. Even if you're an automobile commuter, and many people are, you still walk to your car, you get out of your car, you walk from your car to your destination. So we're all walkers. If you're a bicycle rider, the same thing. Um, so. Our street system needs to balance the needs of all different kinds of transportation, sidewalks uh, that serve walkers, bicyclists, transit users, and cars. All of those things are, all of those types of transportation need to be accommodated by the street system, and they need to be accommodated so that each of the, each of the different modes of transportation work well together and are safe um, when they're next to each other. And then we need paths and crosswalks where they're, they can serve the all the needs of the public. Um, one of the slides I'm going to show much toward the end of the presentation shows actually a street in Boston which is missing a sidewalk. We don't actually have a lot of those. Most of Boston streets actually have sidewalks, but there are still some places where we don't have sidewalks and where lots of people are trying to walk. So it's interesting, even in a city like Boston, which, which has such a deep um, and rich pedestrian infrastructure, we need to think about things like that. <laughs> then variety. I just, I, I mentioned that in terms of land uses, but we think of the variety not just of the types of land uses, but actually this, this slide has pictures mostly of relatively older um, sets of buildings, but we want variety in the age of the buildings we look at, the age of buildings we use, the scale, all of those things go into making an interesting city. Um, I don't think any of us want to live in a city where everything is two stories tall or everything is 50 stories tall. We actually like having a variety different kinds of neighborhoods, different mixes of the things we see at the ground floor, all of those things. And that is a piece of the walking environment. So now I'm going to turn to some of the elements of the physical infrastructure for, for safe walking itself. And the first thing that we think about is how to get across the street safely. And that's what um, crosswalks do for us, in the, for the most part, is they mark where on the street, um, where the location, the traffic, uh, the drivers need to be aware that pedestrians are crossing the street. And signs and, cro and the markings on the street alert drivers that pedestrians are there. And we need to be sure that those crosswalks are smooth, that they're well marked, that they're well lit. Um, that's one of the things that we've been thinking about more lately. We're working with a lot of seniors in the city of Boston and looking specifically at how well crosswalks are lit in different places around the city. And it's an issue particularly as some of the lighting standards and some of the lighting infrastructure changes around the city that we're thinking about more and more. Some of these things seem so basic, it's almost like, why do we need to talk about them? But in fact, we do need to talk about them, and some of them are things that have been set aside for many years, and so we're coming back and working with the city in a lot of places to make sure that we're thinking about them again. So a piece of the pedestrian environment is maintenance, and it's one that we find to be really, really important for making sure that people can walk. So year-round walking, um, snow removal. It's one of, some of you who know me know it's one of my favorite topics. Um, it's also one of the thorniest issues in the city. 
because it's the responsibility of so many different parties. Um, this is something where private landowners are responsible for shoveling sidewalks in front of their properties, where the city is responsible for, for plowing streets and for clearing properties um, that are owned by the city. And it's one of the things that we think about a lot, but it's a very important component of not only accessibility for people, but safety. Um, you see a spike in hospital admissions around falls in the wintertime, and especially when you talk to people, to older people uh, around the city, it's of a very high degree of concern. Trash collection. Um, a number of years ago when we worked um, in some of Boston's neighborhoods and asked people, did really a survey asking people what were some of the biggest disincentives to walking in the community, um, assuming that there were sidewalks in most of the places that we were talking to people there were, the biggest disincentive they talked about from the environmental perspective which was actually trash. That when there was trash, uh, they felt unsafe walking around and the reason is that seeing trash uh, that hasn't been cleaned up sends a message that, the, that um, a place is unloved and unwatched and uncared for. And that messaging is um, very, very important for people who are walking. So trash, maintenance of uh, vacant lots in particular, but just in general, uh, making sure that the streets and sidewalks are clean is a really important element of the walking environment. And then just the level of interest, some of the things around making sure that shop fronts are lit that uh, window displays change from time to time, that stores don't hang up um, paper signs that completely cover the windows so people can't see what's going on inside. All of those details actually make a difference in whether people will walk and whether they feel safe. And then when you turn to making places attractive, uh, there are all sorts of things that uh, inexpensive ways to make streets attractive for people and send a message that you want people walking around. And whether that's banners or whether it's special lighting, um, all of those things really um, send an invitation to people to walk. And it's something that people love. In particular, they like thing, people like things that change so that it's not a static environment that is the same all the time. I attended uh, recently a, an event put on by an organization called Light Boston, which thinks about both uh, utilitarian lighting, how much light do you need on the street, but also how to use lighting as a way to um, create delight in the city, whether that's lighting um, buildings beautifully. City Hall just got relit, um, and it's something that people really notice, that it, it makes the building look special and, and look attractive at night, but also using lighting in ways to, to send a message that there's something special going on at different times of year. Of course, we see that in holiday lights. That's the traditional way, but there are lots of other things that can be done to make a pedestrian environment more interesting. So. Walkability has lots of different forms. It can be very urban. It can be residential neighborhoods. Um, it can be downtown. It can be main streets. All of those things can be really terrific walking environments. They just need these different components to be taken care of. And so why do we care so much about it? Well, these are sort of what we think about as the big four. Why is walking so important? First of all, for health. Um, we, now, we know very well that human beings were designed to move and walking is that most basic form of movement. And, um, and as a term, form of exercise, it's almost as good as very high intensity aerobic exercise. It's also an exercise that everybody can engage in. And so the public health community, and actually one of the presenters today, Mara, is going to talk about public health and why walking is so important to that. Um, second, the environment. Um, as uh, we say on this slide, feet are a zero pollution form of transportation. So. Whether you're thinking about um, having a zero uh, GHG load when you're moving around, feet are good for that, but also walking in combination with uh, transit is a critical way to build um, mobility in for people uh, around the region without um, creating uh, in intensive use of carbon. So we think very much that we are part of the environmental movement, and many of the allies that we work with come from the environmental movement. Then. Um, Finances and the sort of economic health, walkable main streets um, are stronger financially than non-walkable main streets. Uh, transportation costs are a huge piece, the second most expensive element of, uh, for U.S. households of, their, of household expenses. So when uh, households can have zero cars or one car, it's a huge savings uh, and it makes for a much more affordable living. So it's a very important element of why walking and Connections to transit are so important. And finally, sense of community. 
and community vitality. People who live in walkable communities are more apt to know their neighbors. They're more apt to be engaged in, um, in civic life than people who live in places that are, that are concentrated on driving. And that's a really important piece of it. We think what makes Boston such a wonderful place is that people actually see each other, they know each other. When they walk out of their house and walk down the street, they begin to know their neighbors and to recognize what's going on in their neighborhood. And that's a really important piece of why we need walkable communities. So now I'm going to get a little bit more into uh, some of the elements of design. So road design um, affects walkability. And as this slide shows, this does not look like a place where you'd be comfortable crossing the street. And in particular, if you were a senior who walked slowly, if you were walking across the street with a child, this is not a very easy place to cross the street. It's wide open. You don't feel protected from cars. It feels like cars would speed right by. And speed is a really, really critical element of, of walking safety. So a pedestrian who's hit by a vehicle traveling at 20 miles per hour is about their chances of survival are close to 90%. A pedestrian who's hit by a car moving at 40 miles per hour, the chances of survival are about 10%. So that difference, bringing speed from 40 miles an hour down to 20 miles per hour or thereabouts is really critically important to making a safe walking environment. And that's a very, very important piece of the work that we, the Walk Boston is doing with the city on Vision Zero. And it's something we're seeing all actually around the world. Um, City planners, transportation planners are thinking very, very hard about travel speed because that's what is a, the most basic element of a walkable, of a safe walking environment. So then we think about how do we slow cars down? And there, there are a number of different elements that I'm going to talk about. So first, it's narrowing lane widths. Um, for many years, transportation engineers thought we needed wide lanes to make it safe for cars to drive. And what we've learned is that making na lanes narrow, bringing them down to about 10 feet and sometimes even less than 10 feet in width, slows vehicles down and actually makes it safer both for vehicles and very much so for pedestrians. So, so that's an easy fix that we have on roads. And in new roads, we need to be really careful to make sure that we're designing them with narrow lanes. And simply adding what's called a fog line which is the yellow line that you see on this, um, is one way to slow cars. Just painting that line slows cars. And in many places, it provides an opportunity to also add bike lanes, but that depends on the width of the roadway. Next, we think about curb extensions. And this is where you have a bump out at the corner. And a curb extension um, provides a number of different uh, safety features for pedestrians. First, it shortens the crossing distance. So the the distance from curb to curb that you're crossing uh, is smaller. So if you have two curb extensions that are each seven feet deep, it makes the crossing distance 14 feet less on, on a road. And that's a very important uh, change. It makes walkers more visible. When they're standing on a bump out, cars that are coming down the street, if there's parked cars on the street, you can actually see the pedestrians and pedestrians can see the cars. Um, in places with with large numbers of pedestrians, it provides a place for pedestrians to wait to cross the street. And also, actually, during snowy season, uh, if you're not in the path of travel, it's a place where people store snow, and it's actually quite useful for that. Um, next is crosswalk. Uh, two parallel lines has been, have painted on the street have been the standard for many years. Uh, Boston, happily, and many other communities around Massachusetts are now using zebra striping um, with, on a regular basis. It's much more visible. Uh, cars see it. Pedestrians see it. It's a much better way to mark the road. And uh, we encourage it everywhere we work. Whoops. Hmm. Thank you. It's uh, complaining that it needs a power They're coming right now.
technical difficulties to those at home. <laughs> Okay. Ah. okay, terrific. Um, another element that goes into safer crossing, sorry for that, um, is to actually a raised crosswalk, where you bring the crosswalk up close to the level of the sidewalk. doesn't necessarily have to go the full extent up to the, up to the sidewalk, but by creating um, that element in the street, cars are aware that they're coming to a crosswalk, they slow down, and it also allows pedestrians to walk uh, with less level change from on the sidewalk. Um, another one of our favorite tools is the in-street pedestrian sign. It's very inexpensive and very effective at slowing cars down. Uh, because it's actually in the street and not a sign on the side, drivers see it, and it also narrows the travel way because it sort of splits up the, splits up the crossing. Um, this is one of the first things that we recommend to communities and neighborhoods when they're trying to slow traffic down is to use those streets, those signs, sorry. Um, on-street parking is a friend of a, for pedestrians. Um, the cars essentially create a barrier between the moving vehicles and people on the sidewalk. Uh, it's not always the right solution. Sometimes it makes it difficult to provide good bike facilities, but in a number of places where you have, especially where you have relatively fast-moving traffic, walking on a sidewalk that doesn't have parked cars next to it feels very, very different from walking on a sidewalk that has parked cars on it. So it's something, again, depending on the setting, which we think is a really important element of, of, walkable, of walkable places. Um, it can make a very big difference. So thinking about um, going further than just the most basic elements for safety, there are a number of different elements that improve uh, walking comfort and walking safety. So the first is countdown signals that tell people how much time they have to get across the street. Now, this is becoming the standard in the United States for many, many years. It wasn't. Um, it reduces, uh, the evidence is that it reduces crashes by about 50% because people really know how much time they have to get across the street. Um, there's some different ways of using those signals, and there's some discussion. I don't know, Peter, if you're going to get into how to do countdown signals. That no. was. All right. That's, a, that's another, that's a pretty esoteric conversation. But anyway, countdown signals are really, really important. But whenever new signals are installed now, uh, in Boston. They include countdowns. Passable sidewalks. This is one that you would think uh, we would hardly need to talk about, but we do. Not having sidewalks that are obstructed by stuff. And sometimes that stuff is um, t the sort of the equipment of the city. city. All sorts of fi uh, hydrants, uh, po utility poles of a variety of sorts. Um, I sometimes ask have asked contractors who I've seen redoing a street where they've changed the edge of the sidewalk and left um, an obstruction in the, in the street, why, in the sidewalk, sorry, why that's still there. And they said because when they got dug down, they found that the utilities were expensive and they didn't relocate it. And so the question is, if you did that in a street where vehicles are supposed to travel, you would be fired. This wouldn't be an acceptable answer to just say, we're just going to leave it in the middle because it costs some money to move. So this is sort of a a really important detail of sidewalk design that we often uh, see issues with. We worked a number of years ago with, with a cafe where there was a, fi a hydrant left in the sidewalk like that, and we asked them to move a fence um, for their outdoor seating area. They sort of said, why? And we said, because it's a tripping hazard, because this hydrant is nearby. And they said, oh, yes. Uh, the manager said, I had to call an ambulance a couple of weeks ago for somebody that walked right into the hydrant. So really, this is a piece of safety as well as convenience for pedestrians. And then one of our favorite low-cost ways to improve the walking environment is to trim the bushes that grow out over the sidewalk. Um, if, you're, if you're a person in a wheelchair and you come to those bushes, you have to go in the street. You cannot stay on the sidewalk. So this is, it's not a small issue. It's a real issue, and it's something that um, is neighborly to do, and cities can enforce that. Curb cut, and maybe those of you at at home can actually see this diagram, sorry, no. Um, what it shows is the difference between having many different curb cuts to get into many different driveways and consolidating those curb cuts so that people who are walking on the sidewalk aren't constantly crossing moving traffic as they're going down the street and that they don't have to always be looking over their shoulder whether somebody's turning into a driveway. Um, and um, there's a piece of that is to keep the sidewalk level rather than have pe uh, pedestrians go up and down 
and cars to stay level, but have cars go up and over the sidewalk. Again, this has become much more standard. Certainly when we look at development in downtown Boston, the sidewalks are being kept level, but we still have to make that argument in some places that aren't quite as dense. Um, and then making sure that curb cuts that do exist have very tight turns and very narrow lanes so people can't move quickly from the street into a driveway. So sort of the classic place where this is done poorly is at gas stations. Most of you have, most of us have walked down a sidewalk where there's a gas station and the sidewalk essentially disappears and the cars feel like they're just, they're just pulling across the space where pedestrians are walking. Uh, there's a wide, a wide side, there's a wide curb cut, there's a wide driveway and it's, it's a very unsafe situation for pedestrians. So it's one of those things that we work on a lot. Speaking of which, um, tight curb radii, that's sort of the term of art, but what that means is having sharp corners at streets, at driveways, everywhere. It's very important. It's one of the things that slows drivers down. If you, have a, if you think about um, a, a highway cloverleaf, where you can basically get off the highway and change to a different road at 35 or 40 miles an hour, that's sort of the ultimate wide turning radius that we think of. And what we need in our cities and towns where people are walking is the tightest possible so that cars have to slow down a lot when they turn a corner. Again, this is something that's important everywhere across the city. We want to make sure that vehicles are behaving as if there are people walking around because there are. Separating people who are walking down the street from vehicles. I mentioned parked cars. Other ways to do that is with planting strips, with trees, basically using the zone along the edge of the sidewalk to put the kinds of vertical elements that make a division between the sidewalk and the street. Not blocking views, you don't want to have a wall there, but what you want is some things so that the cars slow down because there's, there's vertical elements as they're driving and so that people have some um, protection from the moving cars. And finally, just thinking about what we call generically street furniture. That's trees, it's benches, it's trash receptacles, all the things that make a street part of the living environment for human beings. We need all those things when we walk down the street. We need to find a place to sit down. We need, a, we need shade in the summer. Uh, we need a place to throw trash away. All of those pieces go into a walkable environment that works for people um, no matter what they're doing as they're going down the street. And then finally, last but in no way least, um, is wayfinding, showing people how to get around. Um, the wayfinding that Walk Boston thinks about is is uh, directional information that tells people how long it takes to get to a destination. What we've found is when we tell people it's a 10-minute walk from your house to the shopping area, people are surprised. They, know, they go out of their door, they get in the car, and they drive. Um, and they really have no idea that it's actually a short walk. So this is something we've worked on. Um, we've done signs uh, around Codman Square showing walking distances, and what people told us is that they're surprised. Oh, I didn't know it was only 10 minutes to get to the T or six minutes to get to that intersection, um, to that civic spot. Um, so we think it's really important. It's something that uh, is happening in this country. It's happening in lots of different places around the world that people are realizing that people really just don't know how long it takes to walk places. Um, and it's certainly something we hear about in Boston. So change is possible. These two slides, Vineet, Vision Zero in action. Codman Square. <laughs> we know we can make things safer. This is one of the places where the city has been working, where Walk Boston has been working with the city and with a lot of um, community organizations in Codman Square. We were first approached by the Cod Codman Academy, where a student was hit right outside the door of the school, and the students reached out to us and said, can you help us make our neighborhood safer so that we can feel comfortable in the environment around the school? And we're thrilled that the, the city was responsive to that. The students testified um, to city councilors. They came to the Boston Transportation Department. They testified um, on Beacon Hill. It's pretty exciting, and now there are lots of things going on there. So we're really thrilled to see that we can, we can make improvements. And I just want to touch on some of the ways that we're working with people around the city. So we're doing an age-friendly walking project with working with the Elderly Commission uh, here in the city. Uh, the pilot locations are Mattapan Square, um, a piece of East Boston, and a piece of uh, the South End, Mass Ave, uh, from Huntingnet, Huntington Ave over to the Boston Medical Center. So we're very excited about that. And we've had a lot of seniors come out on walk audits with us and give us information about what's so important to them in the walking environment. 
Um, and by the way, my mentioning benches and trees and available public restrooms, we knew that before, but boy, do we hear it loud and clear working with seniors, and it makes the walking environment better for everybody. Uh, we work with local community groups. Uh, here we're going, we went to walk up Rozzy. Here we're having a meeting in, in uh, a home in Roslindale. This is a group of Boston residents who got together and said, we need to make, make it safer in Roslindale, and so we've been working with them. I know I mentioned walking in a place in Boston with no sidewalk. Cypher Street in South Boston uh, was basically built as a truck route a number of years ago. And in the meantime, there's been a whole lot of housing and a whole lot of jobs built right in this vicinity. And so when you see Cypher Street, there are no sidewalks. There are a lot of trucks, a lot of vehicles, and there are a lot of people walking along the street and cutting across vacant lots. So this is something I know that it's not that the city is not thinking about it. It is. It's complicated. There are a lot of different agencies involved, but there are places in Boston where we still need to build sidewalks. Um, we had a walk there recently, um, and st folks, city employees came, people came from some of the businesses in South Boston, and then a bunch of interested people just to see what was needed. So we actually, one of the places we looked has this sort of what somebody said, why did they make the ri a sidewalk rippled? We said they didn't make a sidewalk ripple. That's actually something to slow trucks down going around the corner. But there's so many people walking here that somebody asked the question, why would somebody make a sidewalk like that? It's not. It's basically a speed bump for trucks. Um, we work with lots of grassroots organizations who are interested in figuring out how to advocate to make their neighborhood more walkable. Um, this is a walk we did recently with Asian Women for Health in Mission Hill who are interested in how can they make their community safer for people walking. And finally, Vision Zero, it's been mentioned a few times. Um, it's an initiative that Mayor Walsh and the city has signed on to and Walk Boston and a number of our fellow advocacy organizations are working with the city all the time. And this is a picture of something that we've been doing with um, people from multiple city departments, transportation, the police, public health, public works, EMS. Um, it's a what's called a rapid response site visit where we go out with the city and look at locations where there have been fatal or very or severe crashes to come up with ways that the city can quickly make some safety improvements. Um, and so I just wanted to end by making some suggestions, asking people to speak up uh, about walking issues at community meetings. Use Boston 311 and report things that you see that need to be fixed to the city. They really do pay attention to that. Uh, build relationships with local elected officials and municipal staff, several of whom have spoken here today. Um, contact the local media to highlight uh, when the importance of safe walking. We need voices saying that in this era when traffic fatalities have been rising, the number of fatalities of pedestrians have been rising, we think um, in large measure because of distracted driving. Um, this, it's really important for the public to be speaking out on this. And finally, join with others in your neighborhood to start a pedestrian committee and really start talking about it. So thanks very much. Thank and you. It was great. I'm done, and we'll hand this over to Mark. Before you do, we're, we're do joined by Council President. Right? Welcome, Ayana. We'll do questions at the end. Um, we'll do questions at the end. Okay. That's all right. We have somebody. Mara. Mara Harlan. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mara. I'm the Health Equity and Wellness Coordinator for Madison Park Development Corporation in Roxbury. Um, this is our 50th year um, in uh, Roxbury. We were Madison Park Development Corporation was founded as a community organizing um, initiative to really address some of the built environment issues that were happening in Roxbury, as well as um, some of the housing issues. So some of this work falls right in line with a lot of um, our founding principles as an organization. Um, currently, some of the work that I do on a regular basis, um, I work with Walk Boston quite frequently around our mass and motion work, which is a policy systems and environmental change initiative um, through the State Department of Public Health to um, improve public health throughout 
um, the state of Massachusetts, specifically in different communities. Um, we're really lucky that the neighborhood of Roxbury has this opportunity to be a part of um, Mass in Motion. So what is public health? Um, public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private, communities, and individuals. Public health saves lives. For each 10% increase in local public health spending, 1.4% there's a 1.4% decrease in diabetes deaths and a 3.2% decrease in cardiovascular deaths. Public health also saves money. Every $1 spent on prevention saves $5.60 on health spending. That's over a five-fold um, savings in return on investment for public health spending. As Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of care. So to really invest in, in prevention strategies versus healthcare strategies um, is really important for the long-term investment in our communities and in our city. So how does this relate to community design and how we, we build healthy communities? Walkable neighborhoods are strongly associated with reduced rates of obesity, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and many, many other chronic diseases. Currently, over 68% of American adults are now overweight or obese, a percentage that has more than doubled since 1960. Also, we're seeing really high rates of um, environmental pollution and environmental health issues um, throughout our country, but especially in cities uh, such as Boston. Walking increases physical, mental, and social health for individuals. It also reduces stress, and stress is one of the main drivers for so many chronic diseases that we're seeing today. Walking increases economic health in communities as well as environmental health, as mentioned earlier. People who live in walkable communities are twice as likely to get enough physical activity as those who don't. People who live near trails are 50% more likely to meet physical activity guidelines set out by the CDC. The number of children who are physically active outside is 84% higher when schoolyards are kept open for public play. Far too often, many schoolyards close after hours, and so kids, are, kids lose that opportunity to play in those areas. And, so, and sometimes public parks are not kept up as well in, um, for kids to play with outside of school hours. However, there is a large equity gap. For those who live in lower income areas, those who live in lower income neighborhoods are 50% less likely to have a recreational facility near their home. They're also far more likely to experience pollution um, and environmental health issues um, because of transportation and because of higher car use based on a lack of um, active transportation opportunities. So I work in Roxbury and some current challenges that we hear from, from people in, in Roxbury um, are that um, community violence and public safety prevents them from walking. The street intersection and design um, is, not, is not safe for them to, to walk on. Uh, gentrification, um, it's, Roxbury is one of the fastest gentrifying neighborhoods in the country. And you know if you don't have um, the spaces in the community that you're used to walking to, maybe the corner stores or a, um, a grocery store or even a friend or a neighbor that, that might have lived down the street from you all your life and then all of a sudden they're not there anymore, there might be a less incentive for you to walk around your community. Um, as men, as uh, Wendy uh, mentioned, um, walking destinations, um, lack of common space, and also um, a lack of social cohesion in the neighborhood also leads to a lack of willingness to walk. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the projects that I work on at Madison Park Development Corporation is Mass in Motion. Uh, Mass in Motion is a statewide movement that is around policy systems and environmental change to really promote um, physical activity as well as healthy eating throughout the state of Massachusetts. Roxbury is really lucky because we were, um, we're partnered with the Boston Public Health Commission on our grant. And our three focus areas are complete streets, active transportation, and urban growing. So what can we do? 
So here in this room, we have city councilors, city staff, as well as public members of, of our um, community. City councilors can support policy measures that enhance mixed-use development, complete streets, and Vision Zero priorities. City staff can work closely with local advocacy organizations as well as the public to identify key areas of concern. So often we see that, that our residents know exactly what they need and what they want, but that information is not always translated well to the decision makers um, who, are, who are deciding what, what changes are to be made. Other decision makers can spend time walking and biking around Boston to better understand these challenges that people face who choose active transportation. I think this is one of the most important things personally, um, because for, for people who are making these decisions, it's hard for you to make a decision if, if you don't personally understand a lot of what's going on. So if you are making a decision about bikeability in Boston, if you are making a decision about walkability in Boston or specific areas, I, I feel like you yourself, as city staff, as, as decision makers, as city councilors, um, should be out there you know, with the public walking and biking and really be able to see for yourself what, what um, challenges are present. Residents of Boston can advocate for safer streets, neighborhoods slow streets. They can attend public meetings and work with advocacy organizations, such as Roxbury in Motion. Ultimately, we want to re decrease our reliance on cars and increase opportunities for active transportation. It would include physical, it will help to improve physical health, mental health, social health, as well as environmental health in our communities. The built environment is one of the most powerful tools we have to combat community violence and eliminate health disparities. Comprehensive design equals positive social outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. All right. Welcome. It's a good phrase. Okay. <laughs> I gotta miss up the phone. Uh, counselors, thank you for uh, having this meeting, and I'm glad to see some of the city staff here. Um, I want to bring attention to how traffic signal design affects pedestrian safety and level of service. And I want to recommend three policies that the city should consider to make our signals work better for the public. Mm -hmm. In many respects, Boston signalized intersections follow pedestrian friendly practices. However, in projects that are outsourced to design firms and subject to city review, the recent track record has many examples of giving pedestrians very poor service and safety, putting the emphasis instead on automobile capacity and delay. Here are some examples. One, Mass Ave in the south end of Boston, where a new, new signal timing plan was implemented in 2012. It has cycles that are 120 seconds long. That means a maximum possible delay to pedestrians of 110 seconds. That leads pedestrians to cross without waiting for the light. And it promotes speeding, which is, of course, a dangerous combination. Any day, you can go to, the, to intersections like Mass Ave and Columbus Ave, Mass Ave and Tremont Street, Harrison Ave, Albany Street. You can see pedestrians who are frustrated with how long they have to wait, how long they have to wait, who start crossing. Uh, sometimes they stop in the middle and stand on the yellow line as fast-moving cars approach and speed past them. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible situation. Another example is the landmark interchange, just uh, put into, into practice this year, 2016. Their pedestrians have a multi-stage crossing with a maximum delay of 180 seconds and an average delay of 120 seconds. You have to wait when you arrive, you have to wait to get a walk signal. When you finally get one, and that could be up to 60 seconds, when you finally get one, you walk to an island where you have to wait for 60 seconds until you get a walk signal to take you to the next island where you have to wait for 30 seconds until you get a walk signal to finally finish your crossing. 
Nobody is willing to wait that long, and so you can imagine pedestrians are just scampering across the street whenever they think they see a gap, uh, this on a road where cars can go pretty fast. And then a third example, uh, right at my university, Huntington Avenue, uh, it was last redesigned in, in 2000, uh, and there they put in signal timings that expected pedestrians to cross from the sidewalk to the median where the, where the uh, green line is, and then, not enough time to get to the other side of the street, then wait there in the median until the next signal cycle and finish their crossing. This is absurd, and nobody ever obeyed that, uh, which means that we constantly have people walking across the street while traffic is coming along at high speed with a green light. Uh, not a, a good situation. As a traffic engineer, I know where terrible designs like this come from. Not from bad engineers, but from the rules and the incentives that the traffic engineers follow and from the software they use. The incentive is to minimize delay for cars, but delay for pedestrians is never measured. The software that they use to optimize traffic signals is all based on car delay. It doesn't even measure pedestrian delay. That's how we get designs that have 30 seconds average delay for cars and 120 seconds average delay for pedestrians. And standard traffic engineering rules say that it's okay to allow pedestrians only enough time to cross to a median and wait there for the next cycle, for the, for the next stage of their crossing. And finally, the priority that we communicate to those doing designs for us is to make green waves for cars, which, make, which lead to long cycles that are dangerous and inconvenient for pedestrians. My research has uncovered a gap in traffic engineering practice that there are no tools for estimating pedestrian delay with multi-stage crossing. To remedy that gap, we have developed a tool that traffic engineers can use that's freely available on my website. And so I recommend that the city consider policies in the following, following three areas. One, simply requiring that any report, any study that reports vehicle delay must also report pedestrian delay. Just require it. If you measure, if you calculate, if you estimate vehicle delay, do it for pedestrian delay. So at least we can see what's going on. Second, an incentive for short cycles. The city should consider a policy indicating a clear preference for cycle lengths of no more than 70 seconds or so, and not allowing cycles longer than a certain amount, I would say 90 seconds, without approval by the chief of streets, with the understanding that such approval would only be given where there's a strong public interest served by a longer cycle. Not, for example, just to reduce the delay for five seconds by cars, but perhaps, yes, if at an intersection like Mass Ave and Melnia Cass, if shortening the cycle to 90 seconds would mean a capacity reduction of 20% or something big like that. And then a third policy, not allowing pedestrian timings that require multi-stage crossing, with, again, not without approval from the chief of streets, with the understanding that such approval would only be given if the timing plan can be shown to offer good service to pedestrians by providing them a green wave, or if some other strong and countervailing public interest is served. Thank you. Um, President, mm -hmm. we have any questions right now? You don't. Um, I just have uh, one question um, for Wendy in regards to the crosswalks. So I used to work for the transport transportation department. I was director of operations. And so payment marking is very expensive. For the we have a lot of So um, you like the zigzag. But I'm just curious at intersections where we have a pedestrian signal. Would you be fine with just a lot of uh, A zebra uh, marking is really better all the time. But if you calculate that against uh, the loss of life, um, I think one of the issues, of course, is that at night and when there are low volumes of pedestrians, that visibility is even more important so sometimes if you if you look around downtown and you might think you know people know that pedestrians are here 
uh, I think it it's the situations when there aren't so many people out on the street where that visibility of those markings is so, so important. Obviously, if it was truly impossible for the city to do that, then I would prioritize prioritize places where there's, you know, there's, it's less clear that there are a lot of pedestrians, but really it is the, it, it is the right thing to do to, to have well-marked pedestrian crossings wherever people are crossing the street. Yeah, that was just been an issue when I was down. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I hear you, um, but I there think. There was not a lot of money in the budget for crossing. And I love them. I, I didn't take it that you didn't like them, yeah. but just that, but I think it's, you know, we think about, when we think about public safety, um, you know, pedestrians, uh, there have been, I'm going to get this wrong probably, but I think there have been 14 pedestrians killed in, by, in traffic crashes this year in the city of Boston. That's a lot of loss of life. So when we think about the investment in the system to make it safer for pedestrians, it's really, this is a big public health issue. And there have been hundreds of pedestrians injured. So I, I think that when we're weighing the importance of, of this, it's, it's pretty high on the list, that safety piece. Oh, I, I'll just yeah. I, I'll echo that. Those the the zebra crossings in the trade, those are called high visibility crosswalk markings. Why would you ever want a low visibility crosswalk marking? Uh, another important thing about markings like that is, do we want to say that pedestrians? We are now guiding you through the auto zone, which is what the two lines do, or do we want to say to drivers, drivers, be careful. You are now crossing a pedestrian zone. That's what the zebra crossings do. The zebra, the zebra marking is visible to a driver from a long distance, and, and, and just it, it changes the color of the road. So now they know they're on something different. I, I will say one thing that we would be fine with eliminating is special pavers. We don't actually like specially paved crosswalks because they tend to heave and they, tend, they wear out fast. And so the city, over a number of years, um, invested in quite a number of those. So we'd be happy to have asphalt with, with zebra markings and not special paving. So I don't know if that's a trade-off that is helpful. But no, I love to see the raise. I like the raise. Well, the raise, that's, now that's, of course, that does require, that's a budget, but it makes a big difference. And the zebra crosswalk, I don't believe we have. Well, that if, if, you, if you start with a ladder and you just take away the two rails, what you're left with, is, 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 is a so zebra. I, sir, I know that one of the things that, that um, and I can't tell you the difference in, in cost, but if you, do, if you do diagonal zebras, they're going to wear out faster than if you do uh, perpendicular zebras in the line with, with the movement of traffic. And, and if you have good uh, crosswalk painting, the painters will put the paint to the extent possible where the the, the tires are not, and that actually extends the life of the stripe crossing pretty significantly. I don't know whether... So we get a little confused. You're saying Z for us, we call them left. So yeah, Z because... Like New York City, for example, like Boylston and Tremont Street might be a perfect example with the cross that four ways. No, no. No, that's a different thing. All right. What's that? That's... A Barnes dance. That's a special when when you stop all the traffic yeah. and the uh, the pedestrians go in all different in all the directions. That's a different thing. This is just we're literally talking about the stripes on the pavement. And Peter, I don't I I don't actually know whether zebra tilted or straight are called different. I should know this, the, but I don't the, actually. The know. stripes should always be oriented with the eyes of the driver. So it right. should be so as it so as it as a driver comes along. If what's, if what's ahead of me is just a one-foot-wide stripe, you can't even see it until you're almost on top right. of it. Whereas a 10-foot-long line aligned right. with the direction a right. driver is going, they can see that a long distance off and know that they're at a crosswalk. Right. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Council President Wu, uh, for convening these series of policy briefings to really get at uh, transit, uh, public, public health, and quality of life issues, uh, specifically with this discussion around walkability. Uh, I'm sorry that I was, I was a bit tardy, uh, but I, I enjoyed what part of your presentations I could hear. Um, uh, first, I want to do a big shout out uh, to Walk Boston, Roxbury in Motion, uh, and my own um, uh, a partial a shout out to Girl Trek, 
uh, which I'm a local ambassador and national movement to right. get one million black women walking by 2018. Um, but I, I wanted to ask about um, one of the things that I love most about walking is the connectivity and the, the fostering of community and not only within the community that you know you call your host community or your home community, um, but the opportunity to make those connections and to go into other other neighborhoods. And we talked about some of the barriers to that relative to you know public safety or lighting or uh, and the like. But one thing that I hadn't heard and I may have just missed it was an accessibility uh, relative to different abilities, and you know how is that being factored into and considered from a planning standpoint? Um, you know, uh, because uh, walking is broadly defined. So if you could just speak to that, and then I have just two quick uh, follow-up questions. So all of the built environment changes that, that the city is making are designed to be accessible for people with disabilities or not. And um, I think the city has a, has a pretty... Um, organized plan of looking through across the city and making the changes that need to be made in terms of curb ramps and accessibility. Um, that's the retrofit of the public space. The intersection, the interface between the public and private space is more complicated because okay. we have an old built environment here and there are a lot of buildings which were designed in days before um, before sure. we were thinking about accessibility. And I think that that's a, that's a more difficult uh, piece of it. Certainly the work that we're doing about age-friendly walking, we're thinking very much about yeah. accessibility. Um, some of the details really drilling down into the specific ways that we handle how buses pull up to the sidewalk, how the relationship between some of the new, safer bike infrastructure and bus operations, some of those things were, I, I would say, we in the advocacy community and the city are still working out. Okay. Um, because sometimes when you try and fix one issue, some other issues become more complicated. Unintended consequences. Um, okay. The other thing that I think yeah. is important to know is that the MBTA has a really extensive program going on of accessibility and called the PATI, P-A-T-I program. And I can't tell you what the acronym stands for at this moment. But one of the things we have been urging the MBTA to do is to make to use that money in a way that makes the most difference for the most number of people. So to invest specifically in bus accessibility and uh, path of travel to buses and accessible bus stops and think about doing that before making some of the much more expensive changes that would need to be made, for example, in some of the commuter rail stations, which has, have much lower volumes than some of the bus okay. routes. Um, Thank you for that clarified. What prompted me to ask that question, and, and, and I know it's a priority of all my colleagues, um, and Councilor Wu has done great work on this specifically. But um, when the point was made about how long the uh, the signal, the, the timer, I was immediately, you know, in in the in in my ear, hearing all the the seniors, the people of different abilities, who feel that it's not long enough. And so again, sort of, you know, how are our approaches and our fixes ones that you know support the most number of people? So right. Um, my, my other, um, you know, uh, comment or question, uh, as it were, um, one of the four hearings that I, I did um, in the wake of and, and what seemed an uptick in bicycle and motor vehicle collisions, uh, what we learned from that community is that, you know, they know where the, the hot spots, the vulnerable uh, intersections are, if you will. And it was really helpful to get that uh, real-time input from them. So as a council from a from a fiscal standpoint, that could then inform our lobbying for where investments needed to be made. For the 14 pedestrians that have been killed this year, do we have similar input from them of intersections? I don't know if there's a pattern, um, you know, was it a certain walk signal, intersection, neighborhood, that kind of thing? Well, certainly it's something that the, I don't know if Vanit actually wants to address it, but the city is certainly thinking about that and looking at it. So the, we know that there are certain corridors, travel corridors in the city, um, which are high crash locations. And they tend to be the relatively, the high volume arterial routes, Mass Ave in particular from the river, from, from the river to, to Boston Medical Center to Melnia Cass is really, was a very high concentration of crashes okay. um, in the city. But in general, it's the relatively higher speed arterials um, that have, there are more people there are more cars, 
there are more bicycles. I mean, they're the places where we have a concentration of travel, and there, we also see a concentration of, of crashes. Um, I was actually at a meeting yesterday with some people from the state who've done an analysis of basically crash patterns throughout the state, looking at, at sort of the ge geography of pedestrian and bicycle crashes. And what they noted, not surprisingly, because those are the places where the people are, is that actually if you look at where bus routes are, whether it's in the city of Boston or anywhere in the state, that those are actually the high crash locations. And so we're this, the state is talking about how to concentrate resources in the places that have bus routes because those are the places where there's um, there are high crash locations okay. for pedestrians and, and bicycles. Mm -hmm. So it all it actually makes sense because that's where the people are. But I think we see the same thing in Boston. Um, Vinit, I don't know if you want to add detail. That's helpful. Okay, that's what I was Thanks. thinking. I just wanted to make sure that we are you know, in real time, gathering and paying attention yeah. to those trends and those repeated uh, sort of vulnerabilities. Right. Um, and then my final question, uh, picking up on my, my point earlier around, I love the connectivity and the community, you know, fostering aspect of this. Um, will we uh, repeat Circle the City? Um, I love this idea of... Um, does, any, does everyone know it what was, this <laughs> Wait, did you work for, that? <laughs> my first comment to that, Councillor Presley, is we never really did circle the city. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. All we did was shut down small sections of the city. I mean, we are we are nowhere close to what New York has done, yeah. what San Jose has done, what Los but Angeles even that one time, it was so has done. Incredible oh, it's it's wonderful when you yeah. when when you shut down a section of street. I was on Blue Hill Ave when it when a section of that was shut right. down, uh, but we have yet to have an event in which you really shut down four, five, six miles that really gives people a chance to circle the city. Is there an appetite for that? With us, there's a great appetite. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of the... One okay. of the Look at Mattapan Food and Fitness in the house. Okay. One All of right. The, yeah. One of, one of the, 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 the big obstacles to that is uh, the police has certain standard procedures that they follow for road closures that are based on, you know, really intense events, block parties and whatnot. And so they think, you know, if you calculate that for the distance here, well, you'd have to have a couple of thousand police and a couple uh, hundred uh, ambulances standing by and so on. And so the cost goes through the roof. It becomes impossible. So we need uh, changes in the procedures that, uh, that, that are meant for something like a Circle the City event that... Uh, you know, what's so dangerous about people walking and having fun on a street that you've got to have okay. medical teams every three blocks as though as though it was a, a marathon. Well, duly or... noted, and we hear that challenge. Yeah. I, I wanna, thank I you wanna... for being cheerleaders and champions of that because it's incredible. <laughs> I want to put down a big challenge, which is there are a number of cities around the world which essentially close all of the streets, not the highways, but the streets to cars. and, and um, for, for a day. For a day. And... Brussels does this every year, and the city goes wild. I mean, the whole the whole city becomes basically pedestrian and bike friendly, except for the limited access routes. Um, I don't I don't know the, how they do it. I don't know the procedures, but I do know people that have been there on those days, and they just say it's just magic. And once the city does it once, basically, the residents say demand that it happen again. Thank you for upping the ante and doing so. so on the record. So I, I throw that back to the city council. It would be fabulous. <laughs> you know, we don't, we're not easily intimidated. Okay. So, okay. you know, we, so we, we, we received that recommendation <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, I beg your, your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, just one final question. Um, when tourists come here, um, if they are avid runners or cyclists, they're able to connect to their apps and different things they can download to find out, you know, what's the closest route to me in the best way. Uh, one of the, the things that I don't see enough of, and I wonder if there's, an, uh, again, an interest in this, is the signage and the wayfinding that will tell you how far you've walked. Um, because the rare instances I've seen that, it is an incentive to me, certainly, to keep going um, when I know that once I hit here, I've done one mile or three miles and the like. I have no idea who can, what goes into that, how expensive that kind of you know, uh, wayfinding and mileage marking is. But so I think um, there are a couple things. One is that uh, we agree the city could use much better pedestrian wayfinding broadly. Actually, wayfinding for everybody, cars too. <laughs> I think it's I think it's complicated. Our our street signs are. If you look at the 
larger illuminated street signs that were put in place in, in a few places downtown. As somebody who's getting older, I look at them and I go, wow, I can read those signs as I'm coming down the street, which is not true for most street signs of any sort. Um, but I think the city, it's something, I, I don't know where it sits in the city's priorities, but to actually do a, a serious wayfinding program for the city of Boston would be a big deal. Um, again, it's something that cities around the world are doing more and more of. Many of them start in sort of the tourist areas because right. that's where people are really lost a lot. I think, um, and all the wayfinding that we do talks about destinations in terms of time as opposed to distance, because okay. what we're trying to do is encourage people to, to understand that it's only five minutes. There's certainly a lot of um, places around the country and a number of cities in Massachusetts have put in some trails that talk, you know, that there's sort of a one mile loop and a two mile loop and a three mile loop. Um, the thing about that is that you need to put it in lots of different places in the city to serve lots of different uh, people. But certainly it's the kind of thing which I think a number of neighborhood organizations have thought about doing and some of them have done. I mean, I don't know if Roxbury in Motion has... You've talked... Actually, what Dorothy, I think, has talked with you guys about doing some loops, um, for example, near Dudley, showing people, like, here's a one-mile loop, here's a two-mile loop. Okay. So I think it's a possibility, but citywide, it's a bigger question. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President. Thank Wong. you. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions or concerns. You're welcome to join us if you do. You don't. Well, this has been a really good discussion. Oh. Uh, you don't. Come on down. I didn't see you. I'm sorry. And please state your name and address for the record. So we all know. Hi, Sarah Freeman, 22 Arbor Way, JP. A uh, simple question on the um, lack of sidewalks. Is there a um, formal procedure if a neighborhood is, has a block or two without one? How do they explore getting one? They should talk to the city councilor and work with them and with the mayor's office to make that. Okay. That's why I was. And a little harder question, um, is the city, or maybe Wendy or Peter are doing this, a lot of the city is not controlled by the city, like it's either DCR or MBTA property or MassDOT. So are you talking to each other about some uniformity? Oh, I thought you were going to say, standards? are you talking to each other about safety? The answer well, to that yeah, is the, yes. <laughs> A I lot. mean, yes, uh, safety. Uh, uniformity, I would say, is probably not yet there. Well, that's probably not the right word. I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling with how to even, even express it, but it, just so you don't notice that right away you've, like, walked into a whole different realm. I, I think, I mean, you've raised a great question. It's one that comes up, actually, with the city around Vision Zero a lot. Um, the rapid response site visits, for example, that we do with the city, um, at least started out really being on city-controlled streets, not necessarily state or especially DCR-controlled roads. And, and we've sort of been, we've been pushing hard that it should be all of the above, especially because people who live in the city don't think, oh, that, that was a DCR road. Mm -hmm. not, it's not the city. I mean, it, these things all, they're of a piece for the public. Um, it is complicated. I mean, there've been, there's been a lot of outreach between the active transportation advocacy world and DCR to try and get DCR better on the page. Um, they're incredibly strapped for resources, so it's difficult to get them to make progress. I mean, as you, Sarah, as you know, <laughs> oh, yes. all too well. Um, I would say MassDOT has been a little bit easier. Uh, the mm -hmm. city and MassDOT work together um, a lot, uh, consult back and forth with each other. Um, so I, I think that's been a little bit, it, uh, it, it's less complicated in some ways. I don't know, Peter, if you want to add. I think everybody knows if you want to find a, 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 an intersection without accessible curb cuts, go to a DCR road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's just now, they will never, never do that on a, a current project. You know, right. they, they mean mm -hmm. well at any time, but. Uh, as Wendy said, their they just their funding is just so low. So they I don't know, but I don't know what it would take to uh, to correct those things. Thank yeah. you. And Sarah, I think you know when um, you asked about getting a sidewalk and you heard about talking to city council. I mean, as you know, you've been talking, you've been 
going through the legislators to talk to about DCR because I mean that's more in their bailiwick. But I yeah. think got to keep doing that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. Hi, um, my name is Mark Tedrow. Um, I'm at 169 Sycamore Street in Rosendale. Uh, question for Peter. Uh, you talked about the pedestrian level of service and asked that it be included uh, in um, all roadway design um, uh, um, 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 calculations. Could you uh, talk to us about the variables um, in the level of service and how it, how, and, and how it works for people who want to you know, be, be, um, and be a little geeky on this? Uh, well, it actually, it's simpler than, than what it might be, Mark. Uh, back in 2000, the level of service for pedestrians at crosswalks was simply based on pedestrian delay. Then the 2010 manual came out with a much more complicated method that involves a whole lot of other variables, and it has proven overly cumbersome, useless, uh, forget about it. So just go back to simply pedestrian delay. The pedestrians have to wait a long time or a short time. There are, the, there are other aspects that deserve attention. You know, is, is there an, enough queuing space? Is, is the crosswalk wide enough? But that only matters at a few crosswalks with right. tons of people, mm -hmm. like right by South Station. Uh, I'm just saying measure. What, what's the delay? You're, you're making a traffic signal timing plan. You're trying to get the delay down for cars to get a level of service D, oh, maybe we can do this tweak and get the level of service down to C. But many of those tweaks that you do to make things better for cars come at the expense of pedestrians. And it's imbalanced to have a high level of service for cars while you have a terrible level of service for pedestrians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, this has been a very good... Uh, Working session, I don't know if you have anything. Council Presley. Well, I'm just hoping and, uh, that now that the administration, as you've seen, uh, increased some of the revenues, the meter fees, and I'm hoping that it will generate more money for the transportation department so we can get the tools necessary to help with some of the pedestrian issues that you brought up today because they're all valid. So um, thank you all for joining us, and we will notify you again when we have our next working session. This um, meeting is adjourned.